Good morning and welcome to our Family Voice Zoom session this morning. My name is Andrew McColl and I'm the Queensland Director of Family Voice. We're joined today by Anthony Dillon and we're talking with about the subject, Can the Voice Improve Anything? Good morning, Anthony. Good morning. Anthony is a psychologist and a researcher at the Australian Catholic University in Sydney. He's a regular commentator on Aboriginal affairs has been saying for two decades that, that uh, political correctness, focusing on differences and identity politics, is killing Aboriginal people as fast as drugs and alcohol. So just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. We'll be running the main point of our Zoom session this morning for about 40 minutes. And after that, I'll be taking questions from our viewers if they wish to put a question to Anthony, and he'll be uh, given the task of answering those questions as well as some from, from myself. So, Anthony, just to begin this morning, you are familiar with some of the problems that the Aboriginal people face today. What do you think they are, and uh, and and what can they be traced to? Um, the problems apply to a subset of Indigenous people. Um, what what portion that is, I don't know, you know, 50 percent, 40, I, I expect less than half, of Indigenous people who haven't, um, don't know how to function effectively in, 20, you know, 21st century modern day Australia. And it's, you know, because they, they've lacked role models themselves, they've been stuck in bad environments. So it's got nothing to do with intelligence or motivation. They are very much a, a product of their environment, uh, and you know, I guess the ultimate. Uh, when you say what can you trace it back to, I mean, I guess the original disruption or forward invasion, whatever you want, to, of the English coming up, you know, and and disrupting things. That's not to say that life was a picnic before they arrived, but you know, so if you ask me, you know, what was the initial thing that kicked it off? Well, then yeah, it would be that, but that's. When I'm asked to give an opinion on solving a problem today, like putting out a fire, I'm more interested in the oxygen that keeps it going than I am in the initial spark that started the fire because you often can't go back and sure. fix it. And sometimes you never know what the spark was. Um, and, you know, the good news is to um, you know, put out a fire, you just need to put out the oxygen. So, for example, you get up to indigenous people. Who, you know, are both you know behaving delinquent antisocial behaviour. One of those indigenous people could come from a good home, and the other could come from a long line of indigenous people that were never really integrated into their society. Okay, so different, you know, two different causes. Yet the fire is the same, and I see putting out the fire for both. Pretty much the same process. Does that make sense? That analogy. Yeah. So, so you're saying that their good home is is a a vital part of what we're talking about here. That that that, yeah. that sets people up. What I'm what, what I'm really saying is, is Garvis, You know, when you look at those indigenous people that aren't um, living a good life, living in poverty, you know, dysfunctional communities, some of those people will will come from a long line of people who are living in situations. Some may have, just, may have come from a good family um, and, you know, through a series of bad choices, bad luck, ended up in the same sort of situation, okay? My, my, what I'm saying is the solution to both is the same. You don't need to go back and trace back, well, was this person, you know, was there misfortune as a result of colonisation, blah, 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 blah. That's just, what's happening today? Okay, do you have the roof over your head? No. Well, let's fix that first of all. What do you think? So, you know, again, coming back to the analogy of, of fire, I'm really not that interested in what the initial spark was that started the fire. I want to know what's the oxygen source that keeps that fire going today. Okay, good. So I was watching the news a couple of months ago now when when Peter Credlin spent three days in Alice Springs, you know, during the Australian Open. I spent and three she, days there this week. Good. 
Good. Well, thank you. Well, and and she reported that there was no one there placing any hope with the voice. Why would that be? Um, because similar to me, I guess. I really don't know what it is or how it stands to help. Now, it's possible, but unlikely. It's possible. It could be a really good thing, but if it was a really good thing, I would have expected someone to explain it. And I, you know, we, we've had certainly many people try and tell it to us, you know, from the top. Elba uh Linda Burney, Langton, all those. And I haven't seen a compelling okay, So I think they're similar to me. But I just want, just tell us in a nutshell, how, how's this going to help? No, nobody's been able to do it. Um, well. <clears throat> okay. I can recall going back, back to the era of Paul Keating and Bob Hawke and it being plainly evident that there was, there was millions of dollars being spent on Aborigines yet it seemed to be the same old problems were still being emphasised, the same old, same old solutions were just, we're just kind of throw more money at the problem and hope it goes away. So was that your kind of analysis as well? Well, yes, a lot of money is um, being thrown at them. And, and, you know, yes, I think that the criticism of a lot of it gets chewed up in bureaucracy and right and that sort of thing. Um, but also, I think some of that money is uh, chewed up in wanting to promote a feel-good Indigenous culture. Yeah, I think. So yeah, those millions that we hear about, you know, a portion of that goes to cross-cultural training and workplaces and you know, all those sorts of things. It's just useful. Um, a lot of it goes towards... Um, Symbolic stuff, which I'm not necessarily against, but if you have to prioritise things, I would spend those millions not on um, symbolic things, but you know, accommodation, cleaning up this, uh, the sunset of the community, that sort of thing. Um, <coughs> again, I just want to emphasise, you know, I'm not, I'm not against, because non Indigenous people have money gets spent on symbolic things for them as well. Okay? Um, so I'm not opposed to that, but I'm just saying we need to spend it on the basic things. So it's a bit, you know, a bit like no side hierarchy. Let's start with safe environments, clean environments, access to good food, protection from the elements. Yeah, yeah. And then we can spend money on flags and museums and getting different public holidays and that sort of thing. So your work as a, a psychologist, Anthony, means that you're dealing with people who have personal challenges, yeah. and, and um, they, may, they may well have attitudes and habits of thinking that need to change. And we would, you know, we call that kind of mindsets, don't we? Now, is that at least one of the things that that the Aboriginal people are facing today? Mindsets that are just won't work for them. Uh, yes, but uh, you know, for those at the extreme end, again, they're in, in poor environments where they're surrounded by you know, people who are not good role models and that sort of thing. Um, so even if, you, even if you put them out of those environments, it would still take a little while to <coughs> get a better expression, you train them, um, you know, educate them on the idea of you know, the relation between germs and health. Right. Um, that sort of thing. Uh, and for some of them, there's a generation today, you know, we talk about stolen generation, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lost generation today, you know, again, how many is in there, hundreds of thousands, I don't know, who, of adults, who, who aren't going, to, it's very unlikely they'll be job ready in their lifetime. You know, right. They've been, they've been out of, Mainstream, you know, they haven't functioned in the mainstream for so long. You know, the, the concept of you know jobs and that sort of thing, and you know, not entirely their fault. So what we should be focused, you know, we should be looking after them as best we can, but make sure their children, their descendants, have access to all the sorts of things that 
Aussie need to function adequately in 21st century modern Australia. So regardless of how dysfunctional, how unschooled the parents are, we've got to make sure that their children have access to schools, they learn about health, and they learn all the skills they need in order to function in modern day Australia. Right. So that would that will be helped in things like traineeships and apprenticeships? Yep. Um, access to schools, good schools. And I saw a good school when I was in Alice Springs. So, um, you know, it's young Aboriginal people. You, you hopefully, the force of that school and that environment will kind of outweigh or overtake any bad influences they see back in the home in their community. <laughs> okay. So, so I've I've worked as a teacher in 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 school, obviously in schools and in schools where there's money being spent, not a problem. It, it you know that's not the problem with schools so much. It, it's it's what's what's being taught and and the the peer group that children are exposed to day in day out. I mean, children go to school thirty or thirty five hours a week, but they 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 go home or they, or they go back to their family over the weekend and what. What I have seen as a teacher is that the home is so influential on a child, isn't it? Yeah. And sometimes it's a toxic environment, but yes, um, you know, that's what I'm saying. You just got to hope that the lessons they learn at school will counter, outweigh bad lessons they, they learn through osmosis, osmosis, modeling in that in their community. So, you know, so thinking about these sorts of issues of of education, finding jobs, the training of people, role models, etc. Do you think government departments can deal with these issues successfully? Well, well in, in theory, I guess. Um, I mean, there's, there's plenty of good Indigenous role models already. Uh, there were great role models at the school that I was at earlier this week. Um, and so, you know, government can provide opportunities, um, but at the end of the day, individuals need to make a choice. And I'm not going to pretend that choice is easy. Again, if you come from a home where you don't see adults work and it's, um, you don't see good hygiene and health practices and that sort of thing, um, it, you know, it, it can be hard. It can be hard. So, yeah. you know, what I'm saying is, it shouldn't be quick to condemn those indigenous people who don't make it and just say, well, you know, you had a choice, blah, blah, blah. You know, there's a lot of factors. You know, it is a bit of a tug of war. Yeah. Um, and, you know, even in, uh, we know that in non indigenous societies, kids can go to a good school and still kind of gravitate towards the bad crowd sometimes. You know, that peer pressure is enough. You know, so, um, you know, it's a, I, I guess ultimately it's a bit like the, um, that American Indian story about the, the grandfather who's speaking with his grandson he tells him that, you know, there's got two wolves inside of it. One wolf is about kindness, loving, caring, working. The other wolf is about anger, ego, selfishness, and they're fighting each other. The grandson says to the grandfather, which wolf wins? He said, the one you see. So, you know, each individual needs to listen to that voice. Um, Take opportunities, uh, take advantage of the opportunities given to them. Be prepared to say no sometimes when the bad crowd are pulling them away. Yeah. Right. Okay. So the kinds of issues that most schools face, you know, meaning some pressures from peers upon children, can be just as much the issue out, out there. You know, you know, with the Aborigines than in the, than in most city schools. Yeah, I mean, the teachers can't follow them home and stay in the home with them. You know? Yeah. But once they leave the school gate, um, it's difficult. And, you know, we just got to hope through that repetition, they come to school and they, they begin to learn. Education <coughs> is important. Yes. Washing my hands is important. Yes. Negotiating with other people who disagree with me is important. Uh, foregoing short term pleasures is important. You know? right. In study, working hard is important. So, you know, hopefully, if they get those messages um, repeatedly from school staff and other influential role models who love them and care for them, that's what 
across that to dedicate to work in the box. Right. So when you went up to the Alice Springs just recently, as you said, what what did you yeah, notice? Can I just add something else too? So I'm talking about the extreme ones there that are you know in dysfunctional communities. Right. Then we've got this other group who are of indigenous people who essentially have you know the, the basics met. You know they, they know where the next meal is coming from and um, they live in a reasonably safe home and that sort of thing. But they get involved with blackness. We just hear this story day after day that you're a victim of colonisation, you're a victim of endless racism, the system is against you, blah 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 blah. <coughs> and you know their minds get moulded as well. And instead of going down that you know path like Warren Mundine, for example, uh, who you know makes something of their lives, or my father, my uncle, and auntie, they become full-time blacktivists. Indies, motors and donors, sort of thing who, um, you know, they, they, they might be healthy, but they're just making trouble. So there's that lot. Yeah. So they become convinced that the world's against them, so they want to be, you know, be rebels. Yeah. yeah, and they want to keep, they want to keep the other indigenous people down. They have a vested interest in having, in having the poor Aboriginal cousin in the country. Yeah. Um, who can justify their existence and their you know, role as cultural expert or whatever it is they have. But does right. that make sense? Yeah, sure. So that's and that's what I would, that's what people tend to do. If, if people can say you're a victim, you've been abused, you've been oppressed, it's yeah. all those that there's bad people down there or out there or somewhere else. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, amongst that group of indigenous people who are doing quite well, yeah, you have people like you see the price. Her mother, Beth Christ, Warren Mundine, uh, and then uh, li living a good life and also having a good attitude to life. Yeah. Uh, then you, you have others who are just as well off as them. Some of them have an even bigger income. But their message is oh, white is evil, we're doomed, blah, blah, blah. And that to me is like, um, it's like Clark in the arteries, you know, sort of starving the heart. Right. Yeah. So it's always easier to find to find fault with somebody else that that will explain my problems or, or my shortcomings. Yeah. And then to say, well, I am this way because you cause that you people out there. Yeah. Exactly. And, and you know, for some of these where it's really funny, some of those ones who are whinging and burning and, and claim to be oppressed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, live in better homes than what you and I do and have better income than what you and I do. Right. You know, don't need to name individuals, but you all know they're out there. Yeah. So so your work as a... It's very quick. I just thought of something. Many, many years ago when I first arrived in Sydney, I went to, a, I think it was a NAIDOC ball. And it was the biggest ballroom I've ever seen in my life. Right. The Aboriginal people there were dressed just, you know, in the most immaculate clothes. The women were beautiful, and I don't begrudge them of that. That's fine. Um, but, you know, a lot of those people, not all of them, but a lot of those people would have been the ones who are, you know, condemning white Australia as being the cause of problems facing Aboriginal people. And so, again, I have nothing against successful. Aboriginal person who, you know, if they want to, you know, wear the most expensive clothes, good on them. That's fine. But don't play the game and telling your, your poorer country cousins that you're the victim of uh, the white man. Yeah. So, so just taking your experience working with people as a psychologist, uh, like like you've been dealing with with individuals face to face one at a time. You're dealing with people in the grassroots who've got personal problems, and you want to be able to say to this person, "Look, you. The reason you've got these problems that you're not going to work, and you don't think anything of yourself, is that you've got some. You've been harboring some false ideas about your capacities or your background or your family. Yeah. It's time for you to change these and start to kind of jettison those ideas. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I unpack that a lot, but that's basically the, the concentrated message. But I'd, I'd unpack it and sort of, you know, build up relationships first and find out what's worked and what's good and just them 
ideas. And maybe we try this. Um, yeah. So, so with people whose whose behaviours hasn't been very good, hasn't been mature, hasn't been long term, you, you've got to work towards changing those attitudes or approaches so or that their, in the future. Or their, their behaviour might be good, but their mood could be low because of um, you know, a lot of factors. Yeah, yeah, and and so that that kind of puts the, the question in in your in your mind and in mine. Will the voice be able to do anything for people in those circumstances? Yeah, yeah, and you know, so far I haven't seen any compelling evidence that it that it will. My concern is, you know, I don't have crystal ball, but I just, I mean, I, I read a, you know, one of those stories in the Australian today. The worst of the worst, the ones I'm most angry about, where there's uh, a kid consideration being adopted. They found out the kid had some additional ancestry. Well, you know, we're concerned about the non-Indigenous adopted parents, blah, blah, blah. Usual story. Oh, so, oh well, so we've got to place them with Indigenous parents, which is just absolute nonsense. Absolute nonsense. My concern is, and, you know, at, currently it's my understanding, that, you know, the policy, the rules are um, ethics attempts should be made Place with, you know an indigenous kid with an indigenous carer. I, I think I'm not 100 percent sure, but I, you know, I think it's quite possible if you get the voice coming coming in uh, scenarios like that, we will see that it's absolutely mandated. Right, that an indigenous kid only ever be placed with an indigenous carer. Okay, I have no problem with that indigenous carer is competent, caring, compassionate, etc. etc. But if it, if it was up to me to make the rules, I would have a list of criteria um, for adopted and foster parents, and colour and culture wouldn't be in the top eight. You know, it might sneak in at number nine or ten, but I'd have other things. First, you know, the top four or five would be mandatory. And, you know, I would see a colour and culture is you know, down on the list here. Yeah, that's fine. If all these other boxes are picked, you know, that's what's more important. Right. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Well, it does. It, it does because what, what you're doing is you're saying, you're saying that the, the colour doesn't matter so much as to ensure that the care of the child is actually competent to do so. And I just have a concern, you know, I can't prove it, but I just have a concern that the voice, you know, if they make suggestions to whoever it is, parliament or executive or whatever, they'll be pushing, well, Aboriginal kids got to be with Aboriginal kids, that sort of thing. Um, I'm concerned that the voice may focus on issues such as changing the names of suburbs because we found out that this suburb was named after a person who committed this atrocious sin 200 years ago, or, you know, or whatever. They're, they're the sorts of things which, you know, are way down on my list of what needs to be. Um, and so that's the concern I have. So, you know, it comes down to, will the boys, will they throw their weight behind cleaning up the dysfunctional community, ensuring that all kids and adults have access to the same opportunities you and I uh, take for granted. Uh, and very importantly, that what goes along with that, so that, as I mentioned that earlier on, there's a, a cohort of adults there that what I call the lost generation where you know, it's very unlikely that they're going to be stepping to a job anytime soon. Uh, will they be taken care of? You know, will we be care for them? But with the younger generation, we need to do more than just care. We need to be putting on them on a, a path that a different direction to the, the path that they Right. So looking back over the last couple of generations, would you say that, that Australia's welfare system has has really helped the Aboriginals or, or possibly hindered them? Uh, hindered them, generally. You know, it certainly would have helped some, but I think just the, the overall... Thing of um, 
you know, us trying to keep keep a, a version of, of a romanticized culture going. Um, you know, keeping these people stuck on, on this land, it's just, it's just uh, paying them to, to do this, hasn't been helpful. Yeah, because I even find here locally where, where I live in Brisbane that if if people if people think that they'll get a, a, a fortnightly payment from Social Security, they then think, what, why should I go out to work? Yeah. And, yeah. You know, why should I pay my bills? Why should I get better in life? Why should I work hard and save money and get that new car or the new house when, in fact, I can just live in this just like it's going and this is really convenient and comfortable for me and, 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 hey, there's food in the fridge and there's, you know, a pack of cigarettes in the cupboard. And so what's the problem, Andrew? And and until you get people to think outside of that kind of locked locked up situation where they're catered for by, by Centrelink every fortnight, come what may, you know, then they'll be trapped in that, won't they? Yeah. Um, so, you know, you, you certainly don't want to reward inappropriate behaviour. Um, you know, the, the old saying, get a person... Hand up, not a hand out. Yeah. So I think Warren Mundine summed it up perfectly, where he said, "You know, the the, um, the welfare system was should have been a, a safety net, but it kind of turned into a hammock." Right. And Warren said, "You know, that safety net should be used as trampoline, sort of bounce out of." Bad decision. So I think I, I think I've paraphrased one there. Uh, okay. Well, that's that's a, that's a good kind of analogy to use because it it does tend to say, I mean, why should I bother? Yeah. So again, it's a bit like now for, for a particular cohort of Indigenous people to um, start expecting them to work. So you know, we need to look after them. Um, have Provide service, more services rather than m money. But the focus has got to be on the next generation where they learn um, what to do to work in order to be fair. Yeah. yeah. So, so you're seeing some possible inconsistencies with the Yes campaign. Uh, well, yeah, that, that's one way of putting it. Uh, well, I guess the biggest thing for me, I just and even even proponents of the Yes campaign have been saying we haven't done a good job of telling this. We haven't done a good job of uh, letting people know exactly how it will work, how it will benefit Aboriginal people. Uh, yeah, we still believe in it. So you know that that's a bit of an inconsistency. Um, if I believe in something, I should at least be able to say. This is roughly how, how it works rather than just let's just have faith or you know, get yourself done. You know, I want to know if you're the nuts and bolts. That kind of work. Yeah. Well, I did see in the Australian recently, uh, Anthony, that, that, that Gary Johns had written that the reason for the Prime Minister's reluctance to explain his model for the voice is that it is a it is not a simple plea for recognition, it's a step towards a new distribution of power in Australia. And its effect is is to establish a, a shadow government. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Yes, I do. Right. And you know, even if the um, even if the, the intention is not to create a shadow government, I think that will evolve. You know, that'll be a byproduct. Right. Um, so yeah, so I'm not saying that's why they're doing it. You know, I'm saying even if they have the best of intentions. Will be an unintended consequence. Right. So really, it's the um, the uh, voice kind of purports to be something that will help the the, the lives of, of a, you know the Aboriginal community, but actually may not accomplish anything helpful at all. I don't think so. Well, at least I haven't seen the plan that will will do this. Um, and now, if I was to you know, if I was in the discussion right now, I would give this point that. If there's anything that needs to be done, I think it can be done now with the existing voices. And by that, I mean people in Indigenous people and also non-Indigenous people in positions of influence, um, whether they work for the government or non-government organisations. Um, you know, I think it can be done now. Right. So, you know, my question is, 
What is it that the voice will do or enable that can't be done right now? Yeah, yeah. Now, having said that, someone might come to, come to me tomorrow with an answer and say, this is what the voice will enable. And, I'll, and I could be persuaded. I'm just saying I can't think of what that would be. I, think, I just think we have everything we need now in order to start fixing problems. Right. So, so just uh, just kind of passing on to some further questions that are coming in now, Anthony, from our viewers in the response to what 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 we're saying. Can you just uh, put some of those questions to us, please, Peter? And that, that are coming in. Thanks. Yeah, shall do. Uh, I've got one here. Hi, Anthony. Uh, one aspect of the whole equation uh, that is missing is the spiritual. And here lies a massive problem that denies individuals, Aboriginals and non-Aboriginals, a moral anchor in life that provides the values to live by uh, to develop strength of character. And this is what is missing in parenting and in government generally. Sorry, is this what is missing in parenting and governing generally? That's certainly part of it. You know, we are spiritual creatures. We, you know, there's that. Uh, you know, and I, I define spiritual to mean there's this recognition that we're more than our bodies, that we're part of something bigger, that we're connected to others, that we need to serve others. And there's certainly programs, whether they come via the voice or not via the voice, need to provide opportunity for Indigenous people to serve other people. You know? uh, which is very often work. You know, you provide a service, you get paid. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Um, there's another sort of a question. If there's no jobs for people, it seems to me likely people would consider school a waste of time. Do you think that's yeah. part of the problem? Yep, yeah, absolutely. If, if you're a kid and you, you haven't seen adults work, you would be thinking, well, why, why go to school? Uncle and auntie, they never went to school and they're doing well, and very often they're not doing well. Um, they're just existing, they're surviving, but they're not thriving. Um, so, yes, it's that hurdle where we need adults who can say, Look, true, I didn't go to school, um, but I want my kids to have the opportunities that I didn't. And, and many of them are doing it to, to varying degrees. Good. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, another question. Uh, proponents of this referendum say that it will give a voice to Indigenous people in Parliament. Don't they have a voice now? Example, their local members of Parliament, the Federal Minister for Indigenous Affairs and various private lobbying to parliamentarians. Yes, that's what I've always said. Um, you know, when we, you know, if I, and I'm I'm a bit naive when it comes to politics, but I, I just know where I live, there's a local member, and that local member there is to address the needs of me, the non-Indigenous people, the Korean people, the, the Chinese people, the German people, you know, all the people. Now, if it turns out that there's a particular group, <coughs> a cultural group or a group with special needs, well, then fine, I don't have a problem with that local member receiving advice from someone who has a bit of expertise um, in the needs of those subjects to provide advice. But a starting point should be always to remember that all Australians have the same fundamental need. They have the same fundamental need. Um, and then, you know, once you've addressed those needs, well, that, you know, that's the starting point. And, you know, if, if language is a barrier or a cultural practices are a barrier, fine. Pull some in to put some input there, but the, the foundation should be left with the, the fundamental needs, which are, you know, safe living places, the opportunity to do good or serve others, which, you know, is often work. Uh, the need to learn, stimulate the, the mind, that sort of thing. Thank you, Anthony. And another question I have here is I've been told uh, 
that uh, we'll be implementing the Uluru Statement from the Heart and that all religious and Aboriginal leaders are in support of it. They imply that I am both non-Christian and a racist for opposing it. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, not, not every Indigenous leader supports it. Um, and, you know, generally, we have had this argument that's been subtle or not so subtle that if you don't support, you know, whether you call it the voice or the inner statement, that you are somehow opposing Indigenous people. Um, and that's not true. And you know, even more subtle, you know, when you hear some leaders say, um, you know, I know Australians will do the right thing. You know, there's a subtle message there saying that if you don't vote, you're doing the wrong thing. You're the wrong person. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. Um, another question. Do you think fatherlessness is a huge problem in the Aboriginal community? And if so, how can we encourage fathers to be involved in their children's lives? Yeah, certainly um, in some sectors, either the physical or psychological absence of a father. You know, a fa you, know you don't have a father or you have a father who's not a good role model. Uh, and, it, you know, it happens with mums as well. Um, so how, how, how can we encourage dads to stick around? And be good dad. I think again, while it's easy to see that as a problem and it causes other problems, it also is the effect of underlying causes. So I'm suggesting that if we can clean up communities, you know, get rid of the rubbish, um, get people to take a sense of pride in their community, have the adults engaged in some sort of work so that they're not sitting there doing nothing, have the kids down to school, um, have them have access to modern services. You have all those things in place. A lot of these things like father, you know, absent fathers and that will be corrected. Crime will be corrected. Suicide will be corrected. Um, so if you know, summarising the basics met, safe, clean environment, Connecting with other people, serving other people, a lot of those problems are just about that. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Anthony. Um, that's, that's what I'm saying. You get a group of people, whether they be black, white, yellow, whatever, put them in a physical location where they don't have access to modern services, where they're not they're not working or they're not engaged in serving other people, and they lack knowledge, you know, basic knowledge about how health works, how the world works, yeah, you're going to have problems. You know, people are going to turn to violence, drugs, alcohol, that sort of thing, regardless of what color you are. But, you know, the, the, the rules are the same. The fundamental needs are the same. We need safe environment, we need people. Yeah, very true. Thank you. Now, this next one is a bit of a statement sort of in favour of the voice, so I'll get your comment on this, Anthony. Uh, surely it's better for the Aboriginal people to be given a voice than to miss this unique opportunity to bring some empowerment and self-determination. And surely it's time we had some faith in God and believe he is still in control, so we'll ensure the outcome is positive for your people, particularly if the people of Australia are more educated about the true nature and value of Aboriginal people and their right as the sovereign guardians of this nation. Anthony, your comment on that? Well, just two things very quickly. As we just said in the previous question, they already have voices. They can write to the local MP, the representatives, uh, that sort of thing. So, you know, how is it that I don't have a voice? I do have a voice. I can write a letter to the editor of the paper. I can knock my MP door, that sort of thing. And then self-determination, let me spend a minute talking about this one. That self-determination can be either defined as something that applies to the individual or at the group level. I believe it, it applies to the individual or it's better when it applies to the individual. And by that I mean, if I had self-determination, 
I make a decision, I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to eat healthy, etc., etc. Okay, those are things that I just decide as an individual. Unfortunately, when it comes to Aboriginal people, self determination has been defined collectively as a group, where it means Aboriginal people accessing services from Aboriginal service providers. And I just think that's dumb. Again, I don't have a problem if that service, if that Aboriginal service provider is competent, is good at what they do, that's great. Um, but to insist on only Aboriginal people can take care of the needs of Aboriginal people, and that self determination is wrong. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, it does make sense. Typically, typically, when they are saying self determination for Aboriginal people, they really mean skepticism. Mm. Right. Yeah, thank you, Ed. We hear these cliches uh, Aboriginal health in Aboriginal hands, you know, which basically means the Aboriginal person should only seek health services from Aboriginal providers. Again, if that provider provides a quality service, Way. Uh, and you know, there's a few of them out there, but the individual should have a choice. They want to walk into the Aboriginal service? Right. They want to walk into the non Aboriginal service? Right. The, the self determination happens when the individual says, I'm going to go to a health service. I'm going to go to the gym. I don't care what color the owners of the gym are. I'm going to go to the gym. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Hmm. That, and that sort of um, has always been my main point for 25 going on 30 years. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. Uh, another uh, question here. Governments have spent billions of dollars trying to close the gap, but have failed to do so. Do you support a Royal Commission to identify where the spending has gone and why it has failed to help Aboriginal people? Oh. This question, I mean, I guess in theory I do, but will this be something else that'll clog up the system? How much will it cost? Um, you know, I can suggest some ideas of why the gap's not closing. Um, we need to focus resources and funds on the, the poor end of town. So, you know, if this is all the indigenous people, uh, we need to invest in those who are poor, okay? Not those who are. And I've always said we need to close the internal gap. That is the gap between you know the, those indigenous people who don't know where the next meal is coming from, compared to people like myself who you know who know where the next meal is coming from. That's the gap that needs closing. Okay, I'd like to see those indigenous people in the poorer end of town have the same opportunities I have, have the same opportunities that the proponents of the voice have. So you need to work with them. So you don't close the gap by giving more to those who already have to touch them. Does that make sense? But, yeah. you know, for example, if I wanted to if I wanted to increase the income, the net income of your family, you can find family, you know, whatever way you want, your brothers and sisters and that family, whatever. One way I could increase the income of the richest of the highest earner in your family, and that would lift the average, yes? But wouldn't a better thing to do to lift the income of the poorest or the lowest earner in your family? Mm. So you're still lifting the average, but you're giving it to those who need it most. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and you know, too often, I think, and this is why the the gap isn't closing as such as what we'd like it to be. It was lumped Indigenous people all in one group and said, let's close the gap between Indigenous and non Indigenous. No, let's close the gap between the poor Indigenous and the well off Indigenous. And the well off Indigenous people are indistinguishable from people like you and I. Yeah? They know where the next year is coming from. <coughs> um, they've got health insurance. Yeah, all that. Thank you, Anthony. That, that's all the questions that I've got, Andrew. Okay, so just, just one question to, to put you, uh, Anthony, if I could. So, so for the person who, who's got a 
a business, say, in Melbourne or Sydney or Brisbane, and they'd like to come out to a place like Alice Springs, set up the business there and employ Aboriginal people, and they've got a couple of million dollars to invest in that business, they can employ 10, 20, 30 people. It might not be lots and lots of money, but it would give young young Aboriginals a, a job and it, it would give them a start and give them a future. What would you recommend to that person? It's really, okay, I'm just going to go a little bit of a tangent here. Maybe, and I'll, if you think I haven't, if you think I've strayed too far, pull me back. But my first thought was, I've thought about this for a long time, if we had a sum of money to invest in a community, in a community, okay? I would do this. <clears throat> I would have some accommodation, some you know, some basic robust accommodation that doesn't require a lot of maintenance. Yeah. Uh, so you know, tile floors, so you don't get dirty carpets and you know, concrete, that sort of thing. Where the indigenous people there in that community would li live there for free. Okay? Now many won't. They prefer living in a shack, that's fine. You know, and it's easy to look at it and say, well, you know, you've given this given them this opportunity, why don't they take it? Many are happy doing what they've always known. However, there would be some who would think, yeah, I'd like to live in that accommodation. But we have a rule. If you live in this accommodation, no booze, no drugs, no violence. You get one warning, I'll stick out. But also, there are some duties you will have in order to stay here. You know, making the garden, and, they, and they're going to teach them how to do the garden if need be. Uh, cleaning the walls, but, you know, so to get the people actually performing duties and tasks that they're capable of doing, because that improves self-esteem. Um, <clears throat> and then, so, you know, if you've got a community where there's 100 adults and only five of them choose to live in that accommodation, in time, the adults might look across and think, yeah, I want to do that as well. Um, so, so have I answered the question of what you would do with the money or did you want it to be more specific about the business? Because if you, if you gave me the money, you said, Anthony, do whatever you want with it. I'm thinking of them doing those communities where poverty and dysfunction is greater. And that's what I would do. Now, if you were to say, Anthony, I'll give you this money. However, you have to, you have to spend it on a business or employment opportunity. Um, then I would say, okay, we, um, we need to, you know, consult with locals who are either, and when I say local, someone who probably lives near the community, not necessarily within the community. We would have a good idea of what sort of business could be started up. And now maybe it's an art business. Because when I was in Alice Springs, walking through the town centre, I did see um, plenty of indigenous people sitting there on the grass with their artwork for sale. I didn't buy any this time. I have bought it in the past. So if they if we were to invest in a business, and you actually had a physical place, shop, you get the, the idea of you come into this place to do your work, where we have the facility for them. Paint, canvases, paint, brushes, water between the brushes, and that sort of thing. Um, and the, you know, people could come there, uh, and then you could have someone else at the other end, you know, either selling the artwork there or taking it in more into the town or other places selling it. So that's possibly what I would do. But you, you certainly want to, you can only get a job or business opportunity at the level that the people are competent at. Okay? So no use setting up a great business if the people just don't know the know how. Don't have the know -how. Um, now, in some of these places, um, 
a lot of the guys just have good mechanical things, you know, they're good when it comes to uh, fixing cars and, and that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, you might be able to set up a, a garage um, where they can, you know, put cars and bikes and that sort of thing and, and teach them some of the business principles of running a business and that sort of thing. Right. Get them used to, um, you know, providing a service and, you know, following certain rules and have I answered your question there? Well, I think you have. I think, I think we're sort of working well, around I mean, it. Another example that comes to mind, I've been to some places before on the coast or on an island, and I, I just think there'd be plenty of rich people of any colour who would love to go to that location and have a fishing trip. Are you guaranteed to catch fish? And... Again, okay, you'd have a local who, who would know, okay, who are some people who would, they could work in a business like this, where they could take charter a boat, take it out, someone who could fill up the fish and cook it and, and that sort of thing, and just start them off slowly. You know, have someone, you know, it could be someone from out of town who can look after the business side of things, but with the, with the hope of passing on those business skills to the person who not only fills the fish, also knows how to do the books. We'll learn how to do the books and that right. sort of thing. But you know, I think running a business is a pain in the neck for anyone, you know, even a white person. When you've got to start up a business and fill out fifty bits of paper and that sort of thing. Have someone take care of that side of it for them. So to, you know, you've got the expertise, you know where the best uh, fishing spots are. We'll pay for you to have a boat license. Uh, and this is what we will expect from you. This is how much we'll pay, pay you. Um, are you happy with that? You know, so a really basic general contract that works in their favour. Um, and so, you know, that, that was the feel I got that, gosh, I would come here and gladly have someone take me to where the fish are biting. And, you know, they, they could supply the, the fishing tackle and that sort of thing. Catch the fish, you bring it back, they fill it up for you, they cook it up for, or, or whatever. A lot of people would pay um, for that, that sort of money. A, a friend of mine told me in remote parts of Australia, you got profiters and, and gem collectors to go out to these places. He said they would pay good money, good accommodation where they could have a shower and that sort of thing. So, you know, looking for a need, uh, giving the people the right amount of help, you know, choosing the right person, giving them the right amount of help that they need in order to with, you know, with the duties involved with that. So yeah. In some places, you'll get some people who could run the business well. Other places need a bit more scaffolding, a bit more help. And to do with the intention of raising them to the standard where they can sort of run the whole business. Yeah. So what you're really talking about is taking a young person or, say, and training them to think, you know, with a, with a kind of capitalist mentality so think about that they're actually supplying their their time, their labour, their skill for the use of somebody else, but but they get remunerated for it. Yes, and That's also, very also important. more importantly, if the people you know, you know you've got to pick the right people within the, in the community, there could be someone with this much skill, they could, and then there could be someone else with this much skill. Yeah, you give them the responsibility appropriate for their skill level. Sure, with the intention of Building up their skill level. And you know, I, I know just as a city person where I'm having to do more and more um, business for myself, where I'm just learning about the bits of paper that I've got to fill out. I'm learning about, you know, the, the, the rules. I'm, fortunately, I'm in a position where I can learn these things slow enough. I've got enough income from that elsewhere that um, I can pay the bills. You know, people do need to, I need to be taught more about this. You know, I'm sort of learning myself at a quite a place and you know, I wish I had a mentor and that's a, that's probably out there to stretch me a little bit each day, learn something new about this. Right. You know, so I, I bring certain skills um, and then the, the business learner. So in these communities, you've got people with certain skills 
Uh, yeah, another opportunity I saw, I was in one community where um, all the kids had bikes. All the bikes were. And, you know, it's unfortunate someone's going to criticise this saying this, but you know that in a few months' time after they have those bikes, they're going to be damaged, they're going to get that tire, and that's not because they're bad people, it's because they haven't learned the need to maintain things. You know, change needs to be oiled and tires need to be pumped up and, and all that sort of thing. And I just sort of think, again, capitalising on the mechanical thing, of these people, which is you get people in the adults in this, in this community. Okay, we're setting up a bike shop. Um, who would like to, to you know, do the, the repair first? Um, you, and you could even keep the kids in the community, you could have bike maintenance classes or you know, learn how to look after your bike yourself. And when it does get busted and you can't fix it yourself, so you can bring it to the bike repair shop and they'll fix it for you. But again, there's no use getting that person who, you know, senses a blunt of, you know, maybe maybe they've been damaged done from alcohol, they haven't seen good role models. There's no use getting them saying, look, we're giving you a job and that's not working. You, you need to pick those people who are ready. And hopefully those who aren't ready will see that and they'll think, oh, I think I could do that. I think I could help out. Okay, <laughs> you've just got to polish the bell on the box. You do that? Yes. Okay. You've done that? Beautiful. And then we elevate to the next. So, you know, going into people's face, stretching them a little bit, but also recognising that within, within that community, there are some people that are you know, so lost that it's, it's really hard for them to get involved in. Great. Well, thank you, Anthony, for taking the time with us today on our subject, Can the Voice Improve Anything? I think we've all learned something about the issues that, that we're facing here, and we thank you for your contribution to the, the debate today. Okay, I hope that helped. Thanks, Anthony. All the best. Thank you. Okay. Bye.